Was President Dwight Eisenhower one of Jehovah's Witnesses? The short answer, no. The long answer, ah, now that is more interesting. Today we're going to take a look at the religious beliefs of the Eisenhower family. Welcome to the Blue Envelope channel. I'm Phil. You know, there's been a lot of celebrities over the years that were raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. The singer Selena. Michael Jackson, Venus and Serena Williams, Donald Glover, the childish Gambino. But has there ever been a U.S. president raised as a witness? Well, that's what we're exploring today in the life of President Eisenhower. It's a really interesting discussion. I'm going to be using two main references. The first is an essay titled, Steeped in Religion, President Eisenhower and the Influence of Jehovah's Witnesses, written by Jerry Bergman. It was published in 1998 in the peer-reviewed journal, Kansas History. Bergman was an active Jehovah's Witness for many years, and his research into the history of the Witnesses eventually triggered, to borrow an ex-Mormon term, a faith crisis, and he ended up eventually leaving the religion. The second major source is the chapter on Eisenhower, in the book, The Faiths of the Postwar Presidents, From Truman to Obama, published in 2014 and written by David L. Holmes. Holmes has a Ph.D. in Religious Studies from Princeton and taught before his retirement at the College of William and Mary. I'll throw a list of the references and links to the references when available in the description box below. There's a lot of interesting reading. Definitely check it out. This is probably going to be a long video. We'll see, but there's so much good source material on this subject, and I want to do the subject justice, so um, buckle up. I think you'll find there's a lot of interesting stuff uh, on this topic. Okay, so just as a high-level overview, President Dwight David Eisenhower was the third of seven sons. He was born to parents named David and Ida Eisenhower. He was born on October 14, 1890, in Denison, Texas. Interestingly, he was originally named David Dwight Eisenhower, but then the names were flipped to Dwight David in order to avoid confusing him with his father, who was also named David. All of the Eisenhower boys were nicknamed Ike, as kids. It was meant as an abbreviation of the, their last name, Eisenhower. But by World War II, only Dwight still used the nickname Ike. Okay, so let's look at Ike's parents. Well, Ike's mother was born Ida Elizabeth Stover in 1862 in Virginia during the middle of the Civil War. She was one of eight children, the only daughter, her parents died fairly early, although her father was able to leave enough savings that each child received a small inheritance when they turned 21. After her parents died, she lived with her grandparents for a while, uh, and then after that with an aunt and uncle. She was initially raised Lutheran, but seems to have become associated with a religious denomination called United Brethren in Christ as she grew up, perhaps through one of her guardians there. Now, the United Brethren had been organized around 1800 among primarily German and Pennsylvania Dutch communities that had immigrated from Europe. It had emerged primarily from the zeitgeist of Mennonite, Methodist, and Reformed churches. It's had various evolutions and divisions over the years. Uh, for example, in 1968, actually about half the membership merged with Methodists to form the United Methodist Church. Currently, the United Brethren in Christ has about 50,000 members in 17 countries. Notable uh, adherents have included James Cox, whose Cox Enterprises may be your cable internet provider you're using today. Uh, there's Francis Scott Key, author of The Star-Spangled Banner, and Milton Wright, better known as the father of aviation pioneers Orville and Wilbur Wright. Now, one branch or, or section of the United Brethren faith was simply called Brethren in Christ, and more commonly it was called the River Brethren, probably named for their location near the Susquehanna River in Pennsylvania. The Brethren, like Mennonites, were one of the plain people groups, so they dressed extremely conservatively, they were a close-knit group, they opposed many of the world's amusements, and they believed that pacifism was obligatory for Christians, among other key doctrines. Now, Ida always had a deep interest in the Bible, 
As a girl, she entered a local Sunday school contest to see who could memorize the most Bible verses in six months. Ida swept the field, memorizing 1,365 verses for the win. Her sons would later finally remember her medal for that accomplishment. They would recall that their parents seemed to have an almost encyclopedic knowledge of the Bible. For example, Paul Hutchinson, editor of Christian Century, wrote in that journal in 1954 that, quote, both father and mother could quote the Bible for any occasion and almost from beginning to end. They owned a concordance, but the sons remember that on the rare occasion when reference to it became necessary, both parents were almost furtive in seeking its aid, unquote. When Ida's aunt and uncle disapproved of her as a girl going to high school, Ida left home. She got a job doing domestic work in exchange for room and board, and she continued her education. She graduated high school at age 19. When she turned 21, she received her small inheritance from her father's estate. She decided for one thing to invest in a piano, which would occupy a proud place in the Eisenhower home in decades to come. And also at that time, she made the decision to move from Virginia out to Kansas. Two of her brothers were already living out in Kansas at that point. So she moved out to the Midwest, um, and for about two years, she worked as a school teacher out there. And then she decided to continue her education, to enroll in college. Now, conveniently, the United Brethren Church had actually founded a college in Kansas, Uh, In 1865, it was called Lane University in Lecompton, Kansas. So Ida enrolled at Lane University. She began her studies around 1885. During her first semester there, she ran into a fellow freshman student. His name was David Eisenhower. They quickly fell in love and were married in the college chapel on September 23rd, 1885. All right, so who was David Eisenhower? Well, David Jacob Eisenhower was born about 16 months after Ida in 1863. The Eisenhower family, like the Stover family, were also German immigrants, Pennsylvania Dutch. They lived in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. They, too, were members of the United Brethren in Christ Church. In 1878, a group of several hundred brethren migrated out to Abilene, Texas. Now, Abilene in the 1870s? Wow. Wild frontier town. It sat at the end of the Chisholm Trail, which was the route that cowboys used to herd cattle from Texas ranches up to the railroad in Abilene. The, I mean, brothels and saloons abounded in town at that time. In 1871, legendary lawman Wild Bill Hickok was brought in to be Marshal of Abilene after outlaws had shot the previous Marshal and chopped off his head with an axe. But despite the wild reputation of Abilene, land was plentiful out there. And uh, so one group of brethren arrived in 1878, followed by a second group the following year. They brought with them 15 train car loads of household and farming equipment and reportedly more than half a million dollars in cash. Large tracts of untouched land were purchased from the Kansas Pacific Railroad, and they began to build homes and farms, a new community just outside of Abilene, which they called Bell Springs. In an essay on whitehousehistory.org, Dennis Medina, who was a longtime curator of the Eisenhower Museum that's now in Abilene, writes that the first group of brethren included three generations of Eisenhowers. There was the patriarch, Frederick Eisenhower, his son, Jacob Eisenhower, and several of Jacob's children, including 15-year-old David, Ike's father. In fact, Jacob, Ike's grandfather, was a minister in the church in Abilene. Like the Mennonites they sprang from, many United Brethren were farmers, and this was true of Jacob. The Brethren quickly formed a business called the Bell Springs Creamery, which was used to process the dairy products the church members were producing on their farms. Interestingly, instead of going into farming, David wanted to go to college, and so he enrolled at Lane University, the United Brethren College, which was out there. It was in Lecompton, about 100 miles away from uh, Abilene, and he started to study engineering. And as we mentioned, he ran into Ida, a fellow freshman. They uh, fell in love, got married, and evidently David and Ida left college after getting married. Neither ultimately graduated. When they got married, David's father, Jacob, gave the couple 160 acres of farmland and several thousand dollars to start running the farm. Pretty large sum at the time. 
But David again avoided farming and instead used the funds to open a general store in the nearby town of Hope, Kansas. In the 1955 book, Jehovah's Witnesses, the New World Society, author Marley Cole, himself one of Jehovah's Witnesses, writes that the Jessup family in Hope were among the store's customers. Lada Jessup, who was a schoolgirl at the time, recalled David and Ida being two humble, earnest Kansans. The following year, 1886, the Eisenhower's first son, Arthur, was born. Arthur, the only son that wouldn't end up attending college, moved to Kansas City when he grew up, and he started working at a bank, eventually becoming vice president of the bank. Unfortunately, the Eisenhower parents lost the general store by about 1888. A long drought at the time meant that farmers were unable to pay their bills at the store. Their second son, Edgar, was born in 1889. He would later go on to law school at the University of Michigan and then move to Washington State, where he worked both as a lawyer and as a director of several companies. After Edgar was born, the family moved down to Denison, Texas, so that David could get work as a railroad mechanic. And that's where Ike was born in 1890, the third son. They called Edgar Big Ike, and Dwight was called Little Ike. Now, the extended Eisenhower family still lived up in Abilene, Kansas, and so in 1892, the family of five moved back there so David could take a job as a manual worker in the Bell Springs Creamery, which was that business co-op owned by the Brethren Church. The family was reportedly down to $24 to their name when they moved back. A little echo there of, you know, prodigal son returning to his family to take a humble job uh, after things don't quite work out on the outside. The family moved into a tiny little one-story house in town there in Abilene. Uh, David would attend, uh, eventually obtain slightly better paying work over the years, uh, first at a gas plant and then at a utility company. But, I mean, overall, they were poor while the boys were growing up, and they were never really well off at any point in their life. The year they moved back, 1892, their fourth son, Roy, was born in Abilene. Roy would go on to work at a drugstore there in town. Then he went to pharmacy school himself and became a pharmacist and would end up owning his own drugstore in nearby Junction City, Kansas. In 1894, their fifth son, Paul, was born. Unfortunately, Paul caught diphtheria and he died at just 10 months old. His death would have major repercussions on the religious beliefs of his parents down the road. In 1898, Earl was born. Earl would later grow up and move out to Washington State, where his older brother Edgar was, and Edgar helped him to pay to attend the University of Washington. He studied engineering there and would go on to work a variety of jobs. He later owned several radio stations in Illinois and, and was elected to the Illinois State Legislature. There was one time when Earl was about three and Ike, who was maybe 10 or 11 at the time, was playing with a knife. He set it up on a windowsill where he thought it was out of reach of Earl, but three-year-old Earl grabbed for the knife and it fell into one of his eyes and blinded it. Ike always felt guilt and remorse for the accident, and it seems to have kind of made him protective of those younger and more helpless. In the following year, 1899, the seventh and last son, Milton, was born. Milton was hired early on as a reporter at one of the local newspapers, the Abilene Reflector. The editor, Charles Harger, liked Milton, and he actually offered to pay his way through Harvard University. Rather overwhelmed, Milton declined the generous offer of Harvard, and Harger then changed the offer to Kansas State Agricultural College, which is now Kansas State University. Uh, Harger was a member of the Board of Trustees there. Well, Milton accepted that offer, and he graduated after about five years. He had to take a break for a while due to almost dying uh, during the Spanish flu pandemic then. After the graduation, Milton uh, began working for the federal government. And uh, after a while, in 1942, he was appointed director of the War Relocation Authority, which was responsible for setting up the internment camps for Japanese-American citizens following the Pearl Harbor attack. Milton would go on to resign after just 90 days, largely disgusted at how the U.S. government was treating the internees, despite his efforts to change things. He would uh, then go on to become president of his alma mater, Kansas State University, in 1943. 
After that, he would serve as president of Penn State University and then Johns Hopkins University. At the same time, he would also be a presidential advisor to his brother Dwight, to John F. Kennedy, and Lyndon Johnson. John F. Kennedy appointed him, along with Eleanor Roosevelt and Walter Ruther, to be the negotiators with Fidel Castro for the release of captured Americans after the failed Bay of Pigs invasion. The boys report that growing up, their father was a strict disciplinarian, quick to break out the strap for whippings when needed. However, he was working long hours at the dairy to provide for his large family, and he just wasn't home a great deal. Ida, on the other hand, was a gentler soul. She was inquisitive. She was a deep believer in education, in pacifism, and in the Bible. The moral qualities and the ethics of their parents seem to have made a deep impact on the boys. Historian David Ambrose wrote in his biography, Eisenhower, Volume 1, that, quote, neither David nor Ida ever smoked or drank or played cards or swore or gambled, unquote. However, as the boys got older, they did play cards and smoke a little bit. David and Ida appear to have been sporadic attenders of the River Brethren Church that David's family had helped found in Abilene, but it was the death of their fifth son, Paul, in 1895 that caused real struggles with their faith. The church offered the typical hope of seeing their baby boy again in heaven in the future, but it didn't quite satisfy uh, Ida. And so three women in the neighborhood offered her a different hope. They were Bible students. They were adherents to the writings of Charles Taze Russell, who had founded the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Now, Russell taught that the dead were not in heaven, but were asleep and awaiting a resurrection. And at that time, the Bible students expected that that would happen in or before 1914. The three women, who were Clara Witt, Mary Thayer, and Emma Holland, sold Ida a a set of the Millennial Dawn books, later called Studies in the Scriptures, as well as a Watchtower magazine subscription. Ida quickly became involved with them with a small group of Bible students in Abilene, and David followed soon thereafter. Now, when you look at the Bible students versus the Brethren in Christ, there's parallels and there's differences. So, for example, both held that mainstream churches had apostatized from the simple truths in the Bible, and that church creeds were roadblocks to what people really needed, which was simply to read the Bible itself. Both were against the baptism of children or infants. Both rejected the many rituals that had grown up in religion, and both were against being soldiers. On the other hand, unlike the River Brethren, the Bible students taught that Jesus was subordinate to God, that the Trinity was a false doctrine, and they were advocates of proselytizing, actively recruiting disciples. They taught that the end was coming in 1914, although this was not wholly unlike what some brethren were teaching. For example, there was a group a few hours north in Tabor, Iowa, called the Hephzibah Faith Missionary Association. They had an orphanage up there as well as a religious school that a number of Mennonite and River Brethren children attended. The Hephzibah group, like a number of brethren, were beginning to teach a holiness doctrine, actually rather it sounds rather similar to Pentecostal teaching. It taught that Holy Spirit could be poured out during services, which could then sanctify members in this ecstatic experience of faith. At least two of David's brothers began to lean toward these teachings. In fact, his brother, Abraham Eisenhower, who had been a veterinarian in Abilene, decided in 1898 that following a conversion experience, he should sell his house and become a traveling evangelist preacher which he did. He traveled with his wife, Anna, all over from the Midwest straight out to California. Conveniently, David and Ida were able to purchase his house for $1,000 when he left Abilene. Though not large by any stretch, it was still considerably bigger than the tiny house they had been living in. And it was this three-bedroom house in which the Eisenhower parents would live for the rest of their lives, and which can be toured today as part of the Eisenhower Center in Abilene. The house at 201 Southeast 4th Street sat on three acres, and David and Ida used the space well to be able to frugally provide for their large family. The property contained cows, chickens, a smokehouse, fruit trees, and a large vegetable garden. In 1943, at the age of 81, Ida would write a note to another one of Jehovah's Witnesses, a Mrs. B.I. Lawson, who had written her. In the note, Ida mentions when she joined the Bible students, who later changed their name to Jehovah's Witnesses, and the letter is reproduced in Marley Cole's 
1955 book. It says, quote, Mrs. Lawson, your letter reached me and I can give you the facts. I have been in the truth since 96, am still in, and glad that I found the truth. It has been a comfort to me. I am now alone since my husband has passed away. My sons are scattered from east to west. I am still living in my own home. Naomi Engel stays with me, and she is a witness too, so my hopes are still good. The Lord knows what is best for us, so I put my trust in the Lord. Ida E. Eisenhower So as Ida writes, it was in 1896 when Ike was about six years old that the Eisenhowers opened their home to be used as a meeting center for the Bible students in Abilene, and it would be used as such for about 20 years. In 1915, they switched to using a rented hall, which is reported to be because the group had outgrown the Eisenhower parlor. Uh, Now, that's very possible, although it should also be noted that it was around 1915 that David stopped attending, as we'll come to in a bit. But for those 20 years, at least, the Eisenhower home was the nucleus of the Bible students in Abilene. The group consisted of the Eisenhowers and a few other couples, about maybe 15 people in total. Ambrose writes, quote, Ida organized meetings of the Bible students of the Watchtower Society, which met on Sundays in her parlor. She played her piano and led the singing, unquote. Edgar would later describe the meetings in the book Six Roads from Abilene, Some Personal Recollections of Edgar Eisenhower, written by John McCallum. He wrote, quote, The meetings were held at our house, and everyone made his own interpretation of the scripture lessons. Mother played the piano, and they sang hymns before and after each meeting. It was a real old-time prayer meeting. They talked to God, read scriptures, and everyone got a chance to state his relationship with him. Their ideas of religion were straightforward and simple. I've never forgotten those scripture lessons, nor the influence they have had in my life. Simple people taking a simple approach to God. We couldn't have forgotten, because my because mother impressed those creeds deep in our memories. Even after I'd grown up, ever, every letter I received from her until the day she died ended with a passage from the Bible. The Sunday meetings were often conducted by David, who switched off with L.D. Tolliver, another Bible student in Abilene. Others in attendance included Mary Thayer, who is one of the three that had originally talked to Ida, Uh, Mary's son, Dr. James Thayer, who was a dentist in Abilene, a couple named the Southworths, and Henry Engel, along with his daughter, Naomi Engel. They were both school teachers. Now, in the 1950s, Gladys Dodd was a divinity student at the Nazarene Theological Seminary in Kansas City, and for her thesis, which she completed in 1959, she chose as her theme the religious background of the Eisenhower family, primarily the period from their arrival in America down to Ike's parents' generation. Dodd writes that the small Bible students group felt an, quote, intellectual and spiritual affinity, unquote, to each other, due to their higher education levels when compared with the United Brethren, who were primarily farmers. The April 1899 Watchtower magazine reported that 10 people in Abilene attended the annual Memorial of Christ's death that year. Ike would later write that the Bible meetings were mainly for adults only, and the boys apparently did not typically attend. Like many congregations of Bible students, the Abilene group, which these groups at the time were called a class or ecclesia, they requested biannual visits from Watchtower representatives. These men, who were called pilgrims, or today would be termed circuit overseers, would visit for two days, twice a year, giving talks to the small group. These special meetings were also held in the Eisenhower parlor, and often the pilgrim was housed there in their house during his visit. When Abraham Eisenhower sold Ida and David his home in 1898, It was with the caveat that the boy's father, Jacob, could move in when he needed more assistance. That occurred in 1900, about two years later, and so a two-bedroom addition was added on for him. Jacob would live there for six years until his death in 1906. It's unknown if there was any friction that resulted from Jacob, a United Brethren minister, living with Ida and David, Bible students, and evidently it generally worked out okay. At least sometimes during this period, the boys attended Sunday school at the United Brethren Church, perhaps 
aided by their grandfather's influence. Uh, for example, the names of Dwight and two of his brothers appear in the attendance listings of the 1906 Brethren Sunday School records. The Sunday School teacher, Ida Hoffman, reported that when Ike did go, he, quote, never seemed to pay any attention or take any interest in the lesson, unquote. Although the boys may not have attended the Sunday parlor meetings, Bible study was an integral part of their life. Ambrose relates that, quote, David read from the Bible before meals, then asked a blessing. After dinner, he brought out the Bible again. When the, Bible, when the boys grew old enough, they took turns reading. Unquote. Ike would later say that he had read the Bible through twice by the time he was 18. In later years, a certain amount of tension did develop between the United Brethren and the Bible students. For example, in 1913, the Brethren periodical called Evangelical Visitor advertised a pamphlet titled The Blasphemous Religion Which Teaches the Annihilation of Jesus Christ and described it as, quote, the best yet publication against Russellism, unquote. <laughs> Russellism, as the Bible students were sometimes known at that time. The editor recommended that all brethren ministers should read this pamphlet. In the other camp, under the leadership of Russell's successor as president of the Watchtower Society, Joseph Rutherford, the Bible students took a more assertive tone in condemning all other religions, including the River Brethren. Slogans such as, Religion is a snare and a racket, became common. In 1928, David's brother Abraham wrote in to the evangelical visitor about Bible students. In part, he said, quote, Oh, foolhearted nonsense! It is the devil's asbestos blanket to cover up the realities of a hellfire judgment. The word of God will tear off this infamous lie and expose the realities of an existence of life after death, unquote. Gladys Dodd writes that, quote, a number of the River Brethren had become followers of Russell, unquote. And while there's no records of exactly how many did, evidently it was in sufficient numbers to concern the Brethren and other similar groups. Ida became a zealous spreader of the Bible student's message. Now, Dodd actually writes that she was a coal porter, what would be called a regular pioneer among Jehovah's Witnesses today, but that may have been on a part-time basis as she was primarily busy raising her large family. Through the Bible students, David in particular became interested in pyramidology, which was a key watchtower doctrine for several decades in the religion. Russell had explained that the Great Pyramid in Giza, Egypt, was in fact God's own witness on equal footing with the Bible itself, and that the dimensions of various chambers and passages in the pyramid confirmed and explained Bible prophecies, including, for example, that mankind was living in the end times, and that they would culminate in the destruction of the wicked in 1914. Numerous historians relate that a 6 foot by 10 foot wall chart with a detailed diagram of the Great Pyramid was displayed in the Eisenhower home for years. In his book, The Eisenhowers, Steve Neal writes that David made the chart himself. However, the diagram was something produced by the Watchtower Society at that time, first published in 1898 in Volume 1 of the Millennial Dawn series. And the Watchtower later, the society later sold a wall chart of the pyramid to Bible study groups. At any rate, whether homemade or the commercial version, the chart fascinated the Eisenhower boys when they were growing up. Neil writes, quote, Captivated by the bizarre drawing, the son spent hours studying David's creation, unquote. Dodd writes, quote, As might be expected, this demonstration fascinated his children. The chart came to be one of the family's most prized possessions, unquote. Now, the family had no money for the boys to attend college, so Edgar and Ike, who were one year apart, made a pact that they would put each other through college, alternating years working while the other attended classes. Edgar went off to school first, going, as mentioned, to the University of Michigan. Meanwhile, Ike worked at the church-owned Bell Springs Creamery, as his father and essentially all the boys did while growing up. When Edgar returned home, he requested that he be able to return to school for a second year, and Ike agreed to this. A school friend suggested to Ike that they apply together to the U.S. Naval Academy, which didn't cost any tuition. Now, this appealed to Ike, who could see that he would need to pay his own way through college, and so he and his friend both passed the entrance exam, 
But by that point, Ike was too old to be accepted into the Naval Academy. Instead, he accepted an appointment to the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Ike attended West Point from 1911 to 1915. For his parents, and especially his mother, who had belonged now to two religions which frowned on going to war, the decision to go to West Point was disappointing. However, she allowed her sons to make their own decisions and was deeply proud of their accomplishments. In his book, At Ease, Stories I Tell to Friends, Ike would later write about his mother and the Bible students, quote, They were true conscientious objectors to war. Though none of her sons could accept her conviction in this matter, she refused to push her beliefs on us, just as she refused to modify her own, unquote. At West Point, Ike no doubt attended chapel services regularly since chapel attendance was mandatory until the 1970s there. In 1912, the annual Bible Students' Convention was held in Washington, D.C. from July 7th to the 14th. Cole writes that after the convention ended, Ida and David traveled up to West Point to visit Ike. They went with another Bible student couple from Abilene, the dentist Dr. James Thayer, and his wife, Lada Jessup Thayer. You might recall Lada was the schoolgirl who had frequented the Eisenhower General Store in Hope in the 1880s. Lada had later moved to Abilene, joined the Bible students, and married James Thayer. It was her mother-in-law, Mary, that had first talked to Ida about the Bible students. Cole writes that they traveled from Washington, D.C. by train to New York, and then by Hudson River Steamer to West Point. Ike, who had just completed his plea beer, quote, graciously showed them around the grounds, unquote. In 1914, World War I began. But while these momentous events were happening in the earth, there was no evidence that God and Christ were coming with their heavenly forces to make the earth a paradise and take the faithful to heaven, as Russell and the Watchtower Society had long predicted. That deep hope of Ida and David of seeing their baby son Paul in the resurrection went unfulfilled. In 1915, David Eisenhower, disappointed and disillusioned, began to slow down in his affiliation with the Bible students, as many members did in that time period. The group stopped meeting in the Eisenhower home that year and moved to a rented hall in Abilene. In his 2012 book, The Faiths of the Postwar Presidents, historian David L. Holmes writes that, quote, Although David left the society around 1915, he nevertheless continued to study the Bible daily, keeping a Greek New Testament at his bedside, unquote. Dodd writes that, quote, by 1919, David Eisenhower's interest in Russell had definitely waned, and before his death in 1942, he is said to have renounced the doctrine of Russell. Unquote. While David's interest may indeed have waned by 1919, he continued to have at least some association with the Bible students as of 1921. In Watchtower Society records donated to the Eisenhower Presidential Library, David's name appears in a 1921 document from the Abilene Congregation. In the Congregation Minutes from December 29th, it's noted that David and Ida both passed the VDM exam. Now, the VDM questions were essentially an early version of the exams which potential Jehovah's Witnesses today have to take before being approved for baptism. VDM stood for the Latin phrase, Verbi de Minister, or in English, Minister of the Divine Word. It was a 22-question short-answer exam introduced in 1916 by the Watchtower Society, and it covered things such as Watchtower doctrine and a person's loyalty to the society. Now, currently in Jehovah's Witnesses, and this will sound very odd, but children as young as seven years old can be ordained as ministers. But the VDM exam of the early 1900s was originally just for the traveling representatives of the Watchtower Society, the men called pilgrims, the forerunners of what Jehovah's Witnesses now call circuit overseers. After completing the test, pilgrims would send it to be graded at Watchtower headquarters. Applicants needed an 85% to pass, at which point the society would confer upon them the degree of Minister of the Divine Word. A copy of the questions can be seen on page 215 of the official history published by Jehovah's Witnesses, the book 
Jehovah's Witnesses, Proclaimers of God's Kingdom. Soon after the VDM certification was created, individual congregation members began writing to headquarters asking if they could take the VDM test. And before too long, it was a requirement that all elders and deacons in a congregation be VDM. As mentioned, David and Ida became certified in 1921. By 1925, David would write a letter to Edward Ford, who was a Bible student and a longtime friend. In the letter, which is cited in Bergman's essay, David stated that a critical factor causing his disillusionment with the Watchtower was its end-of-the-world prophecy failures, including 1914 and 1915. As Holmes says, David remained a student of the scriptures after leaving the Bible students, including studying it in the original Greek. His oldest son Arthur wrote that his, quote, reading habits were confined to the Bible or anything related to the Bible, unquote. The youngest son, Milton, added that his father also, quote, read history, serious magazines, newspapers, and religion literature, unquote. While David's interest in the Bible students waned after 1915, Ida continued to be an active member of the Abilene congregation. When Ike graduated from West Point in 1915, his mother gave him a copy of the American Standard Version of the Bible as a graduation present. That was the Bible used and printed by the Watchtower Society at that time, which preferred it because of its consistent use of the word Jehovah as God's name. After his graduation, Ike requested an overseas post, but instead was assigned to a series of stateside assignments during World War I. Later in 1915, he was stationed at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas. In an interesting coincidence, Anthony Morris, who is one of the current members of the eight-person committee that now directs Jehovah's Witnesses, called the Governing Body, uh, he was also stationed at Fort Sam Houston during his army service in the Vietnam War. It was in 1915 San Antonio that Ike met his wife, Mamie, and they got married in 1916. Born in 1896, Mamie had grown up in a rather well-to-do family. Her father was Presbyterian, while her mother, a first-generation Swedish-American, was raised in a strict evangelical Swedish denomination. Mamie would later describe what it was like going to church with her, with her maternal grandparents as a girl. She would say, quote, After we'd been in the Swedish church with Grandma and Grandpa, which of course we couldn't understand, we'd come home and all we could do was sit on the steps and watch people go by. We couldn't play cards. We couldn't do anything. It was awful. Unquote. Well, Mamie's mother was also not overly fond of the strict Swedish church, and so Mamie never became deeply involved with it. When Ike and Mamie would later visit Ike's parents, she may have had flashbacks to those visits with her Swedish grandparents. Dennis Medina writes that Ike would usually go into town to visit his male friends, leaving Mamie with her in-laws. They, of course, did not condone worldly things like playing cards, smoking, certainly not drinking, and so Mamie would often end up slipping upstairs to sit by an open bedroom window and smoke a cigarette, blowing the smoke out through the window screen. Mamie experienced many encounters with death early on in life. All four of her grandparents had died by the time she turned 12, two of her sisters died while teenagers, and her greatest loss occurred January 2, 1921, when the Eisenhower's three-year-old son Dowd died of scarlet fever. Ike would later say, quote, For Mamie, the loss was heartbreaking, and her grief in turn would have broken the hardest heart, unquote. And about Ike, Mamie would later say, quote, For a long time, it was as if a shining light had gone out in Ike's life. Throughout all the years that followed, the memory of those bleak days was a deep inner pain that never seemed to diminish much, unquote. While many turned to religion in times of tragedy, Ike and Mamie largely remained religiously inactive for this period. They attended the Presbyterian Church at times and enrolled their second son John in Sunday school when they lived for a little while in Denver, but overall organized religion was almost non-existent in their lives for several decades. Ike rarely attended military chapel services, and despite being a prolific letter writer, his correspondence almost never contains religious or Bible references. The letters of Mamie are similar. Since Ike came from two religions that did not believe in baptizing children, 
the Brethren in Christ, and the Bible students, he entered the, the army unbaptized, and that is how he would exit the army more than three decades later. Such a non-practicing stance was quite unusual at the time for military leaders. Among his fellow generals, including Pershing, Marshall, MacArthur, and Patton, a strong Episcopalian culture existed, and they frequently referenced God in their speeches. This was something extremely rare for Ike to do, although in later years he would talk a bit more about the strong faith in God he had had during the war years. After World War I, Ike served under various generals and by 1941 had been appointed to the rank of Brigadier General. After Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941, the U.S. entered World War II. In February 1942, Ike was appointed head of the War Plans Division in Washington, D.C., which planned war strategy for the multiple fronts. On March 10th, Ike's father David, who had been ill, died. He was 78. Ike's duties did not allow him the time to leave and travel to his father's funeral, but in his diary, he wrote about what he was thinking. He wrote, quote, I have felt terribly. I should like so much to be with my mother these few days, but we're at war, and war is not soft. It has no time to indulge in even the deepest and most sacred emotions. I loved my dad. I think my mother the finest person I've ever known. She has been the inspiration for Dad's life, a true helpmeet in every sense of the word. I'm quitting work now, 7.30 p.m. I haven't the heart to go on. Unquote. The next day, the day of the funeral, Ike isolated himself and took 30 minutes to reflect on his father's life. He wrote in his diary all of the reasons he admired his father. The list was long. He finished... Quote, his finest monument is his reputation in Abilene and Dickinson County, Kansas. Because of it, all central Kansas helped me to secure an appointment to West Point in 1911, and 30 years later it did the same for my son, John. I am proud he was my father. My only regret is that it was always so difficult to let him know the great depth of my affection for him. Unquote. David was given a Jehovah's Witness funeral, despite the evidence that he had stopped his affiliation decades earlier. There are conflicting narratives surrounding this. Marley Cole, who was a Jehovah's Witness, writes that, quote, David had requested that his funeral service be conducted by James L. Thayer. For more than 25 years, Dr. Thayer had been serving as appointed leader of the Abilene Bible class. Assisting at the funeral was Fred K. Southworth, another longtime ordained minister of that Bible students group at Abilene. Today he resides at Hutchinson, Kansas. For more than 40 years, Fred Southworth had been an intimate friend of both David and Ida Eisenhower. Unquote. The essay by Jerry Bergman, an ex-Jehovah's Witness, offers a somewhat different version of events. He writes, quote, Ida's nurse, Naomi Engel, was a strong-willed witness who had arranged a Jehovah's Witness funeral for David, even though he had made it clear before his death that he was no longer a believer. Edgar Eisenhower stated that his father left the Watchtower because he couldn't go along with the sheer dogma that was so much a part of their thinking. His sons later adamantly claimed that David accompanied his wife on Watchtower activities primarily in an effort to appease her. Unquote. When David had left the Watchtower Society years earlier, there is no evidence that he returned to the Brethren in Christ or that he joined any other religion. He remained non-denominational, an avid Bible reader with a deeply personal relationship with God, one that did not rely on other people, literature, or meetings for sustenance. In many ways, the spiritual lives of Ike and his brothers as adults were very similar to that of their father. On the other hand, Ida had remained a faithful member of the Watchtower Society, first as a Bible student and then as one of Jehovah's Witnesses after the name was changed in 1931. Watchtower records in the Eisenhower Library show that she held many positions of responsibility in the Abilene congregation. Over the years, she was the official organist, proposed many motions during meetings, was children's class leader, and was in charge of preaching campaigns in various sections of the city. 
The Proclaimer's book explains on page 214 that in 1932, organizational changes in the Watchtower Society were made. Previously, in a congregation, a group of men were elected by congregation members each year to be the elders. The elders were the men who would oversee the congregation. Now, a service director would be appointed by Watchtower headquarters, and he would then be assisted by a group of up to 10 men called the service committee, who would be elected by the congregation. The book goes on to explain, quote, The members of the congregation also voted for a chairman to preside at their meetings, as well as for a secretary and treasurer. All of these were men who were active witnesses of Jehovah, unquote. Interestingly, the records donated to the Eisenhower Center by the Watchtower Society itself contradict this statement that only men served in these positions. The congregation paperwork shows that Ida served first as assistant treasurer beginning in 1933, and then in 1935 was elected by the congregation to be treasurer. In addition to handling many positions of responsibility in the congregation, as well as attending the annual witness conventions and assemblies, Ida actively shared in the public preaching ministry of Jehovah's Witnesses, despite her advancing age. The October 22, 1946 issue of Awake reports that Ida became inactive in her public preaching only in 1942 when she was 80 years old, and then only due to failing health. The preaching style of Jehovah's Witnesses at that time heavily featured what was termed street work, standing in downtown areas, selling watchtower literature, and talking to passersby. As Ike became more and more prominent in the public eye, interest in Ida also grew, and her public ministry made her an easy target for harassment by pushy newsmen and reporters visiting Abilene. This, in turn, made her sons increasingly concerned about her safety and privacy. As the parents got older, Roy was the son that kept a close eye on them. He was a pharmacist in the nearby town of Junction City, Kansas, and since all the other boys lived in other states, Roy would visit Abilene every week to check on David and Ida. He also handled the money that Ike and likely two of the other boys provided for their mother's care. This was all the more important once David had died. But tragedy struck on June 17, 1942, when Roy died suddenly at just 49 years old, just three months after his father had died. Now, Ike was a very active letter writer, even during the war years, and his correspondence is preserved in the presidential archives at Abilene. Many of the letters he wrote to his hometown during World War II are compiled in the essay by historian Kerry Irish titled, Hometown Support in the Midst of War, published in 2002 in the journal Kansas History. After he had learned that Roy had died, Ike wrote to a friend in Abilene, I do not know how my mother will get along. Ida was now 80 years old, and Irish writes that, quote, Since David's death, Ida Eisenhower's mind had been deteriorating, unquote. Now that Roy was also gone, the remaining sons felt it would be unsafe for their mother to live by herself. Another witness in the Abilene congregation named Naomi Engel, who had been a school teacher, offered to be a live-in companion for Ida, and so the boys hired her for this role. As mentioned earlier, Miller's biography refers to Naomi as the strong-willed witness who had helped arrange a Jehovah's Witness funeral for David. In the summer of 1942, Abilene held Ike Day, a celebration of their hometown boy made good. Irish writes that Ida was escorted as guest of honor to the event by Charlie Harger, editor of the Abilene newspaper, the Abilene Reflector Chronicle. Harger was the close family friend who had helped almost all the Eisenhower boys, including Ike, to attend college. At the celebration, Harger and and Ida listened to the band play patriotic music, and Ida was introduced to the cheers of the thousand or more people present. Then Harger gave a speech about Ike. Harger related the night's events to Ike afterward in a letter, and Ike wrote back in part, quote, My greatest delight was derived from the fact that the good Kansans that took part in the celebration recognized that if any credit is due, it belongs to my mother, unquote. Later in 1942, Ike was appointed to oversee the Allied invasion of North Africa, known as Operation Torch. 
This invasion would extend well into 1943. In April 1943, a childhood friend named Frances Curry wrote a letter to Ike, describing a visit she had with Ida. She said that she, Ida, and Naomi Engel sat at the kitchen table on a warm spring evening while Naomi read one of Ike's letters to his mother. Ike had written that Ida was, quote, the most wonderful mother in the world. Frances wrote Ike that when Naomi read that part, Ida just beamed. And while she said, of course, that doesn't mean anything, she blushed like a girl. Frances went on to write that Ida, quote, was glowing with happiness and health. Since she is able to get out into the garden and dig, her eyes are shining, her cheeks are rosy, even the tip of her nose vies with the blossoms of the redbud trees which are blooming all over the town. We sat with the west door open, and not only the dining room, but the whole house was bathed in the warm evening sunlight of early spring. They showed me the grand pictures which the photographers from some big magazine had taken of your mother. Such large and such homey scenes. I wish they would send them to you. It would be the next best thing to an actual visit home. But Naomi said they were afraid they might get lost. I am afraid, were it I, that I would take the chance. One can always get more pictures. We talked of you and just talked. Your mother is always so happy when we get down for a visit that I always go away refreshed. So maybe this little secondhand visit will help will help to refresh you also and to lighten your burdens a little. After receiving the letter in May, Ike wrote back how appreciative he was for Francis sharing this homey scene with him. It was also in May that his brother Milton took the job as president of Kansas State University, a position he would hold for seven years. Kansas State is in Manhattan, Kansas, only about 40 miles from Abilene, and this location allowed Milton to be able to care for his mother more personally. In April, Ida attended a Jehovah's Witness assembly in Wichita, and reporters noticed her there. On April 19th, there was a front-page story in the Wichita Beacon, which ran a picture of her with the headline, Ike's Mom, Jehovah's Witness, 50 Years. The story primarily focused on the irony of her pacifism being a Jehovah's Witness, while her son was an army general. Although Ike may have been embarrassed by the story, he never spoke against Jehovah's Witnesses. In a letter Ike wrote to his brother Arthur about the matter on May 18th, he expressed his view that she could believe as she wished, just as she had never insisted her sons believe as she did. He wrote that her, quote, happiness in her religion means more to me than any damn wisecrack that a newspaper man can get publicized, unquote. It was in June that year that Ida wrote that letter to Mrs. B. I. Lawson of Long Island, stating that she had been a faithful member of the Watchtower Society since 1896. She wrote, quote, I am still living in my own home. Naomi Engel stays with me, and she is a witness too, so my hopes are still good, unquote. In July, Francis Curry wrote to Ike, describing another visit with Ida. Francis had seen a recent newsreel in which Ike was awarded a medal by the French, In the Eisenhower kitchen, she acted out the scene for Ida of Ike being kissed on both cheeks by the French General Giraud, a novel occurrence in the Midwest of the 1940s. She said that Ida was feeling great and had even said she was thinking about taking her first airplane trip with Ike once the war was over. After the North Africa operation was completed, Ike was appointed to direct the invasion of mainland Italy, known as Operation Avalanche. That operation was executed beginning on September 9th. In a letter dated November 22nd, Francis told Ike that Milton returning to Manhattan, Kansas had been a big boost to Ida. There was a distinct possibility that Ike would soon return to the States to become President Roosevelt's chief of staff, but ultimately FDR kept General Marshall as chief of staff. Marshall was a key helper to the president, And this decision meant, in turn, that Eisenhower would take on new responsibilities in the war in Europe. Roosevelt appointed Eisenhower as Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. His next task? Directing the D-Day landings in Normandy in June 1944, known as Operation Overlord. Marshall realized that Eisenhower could use a break, and ordered him home for a short rest. In January, Ike visited Mamie and also made a quick and quiet trip to Abilene to see his mother. 
Mixed in were conferences with Marshall and Roosevelt. Then it was back to England to get ready for D-Day. Ike made the decision to go ahead with launching Operation Overlord on June 6, 1944. Frances Curry waited several weeks and then wrote Ike at the end of June. She said that she had had a grand visit with Ida, writing that, quote, She saw me coming up onto the porch through the window, and she bounded to the door as spry as a cricket. She was really a patriotic study, with her cheeks a glowing red, her white hair done up in pink curls, and the blue of her frock making a picture of happy, contented normalcy, an oasis in this cockeyed world, unquote. Knowing that Jehovah's Witnesses frowned on the flag salute, it is doubtful Ida was trying to look patriotic, but she was certainly still doing well, still getting out to work in the yard of Ike's childhood home there. Ida's birthday was May 1st, and Francis wrote that Edgar and some of the Curry girls had attended Ida's birthday party. She told Ike that everybody had a lovely time as the family's memories were hashed over. This account may sound very odd to current Jehovah's Witnesses since the Watchtower Society now forbids celebrating birthdays. However, that is a doctrine first introduced in a 1951 Watchtower magazine article. In the 1940s, Witnesses cheerfully held birthday parties, as Francis describes. In her letter, she assured Eisenhower that his mother was still placid and serene in spite of the intensified fighting in France. In August 1944, Jehovah's Witnesses held their annual convention in Denver, Colorado. One of the attendees was a soldier named Richard Bokel. He had converted to Jehovah's Witnesses after joining the army, which put him in a very ticklish position with his superiors as he tried to follow the Watchtower Society direction that Witnesses should be neutral in wars. He'd been granted a furlough to attend the convention, and during one session, he ended up seated seated next to a witness from Abilene. It was Lotta Thayer. As he talked about his troubles in the Army, Lotta had an interesting response. Bokel writes about it in an autobiographical article published in the October 15, 1980 Watchtower magazine. He writes, Lotta said, Do you know who my neighbor is? It's General Eisenhower's mother. She's one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Would you like her to write you? I sure would, Bokel exclaimed. After the convention ended and he returned to his unit in Colorado, he refused guard duty and was ordered to the headquarters tent. He writes that while he was waiting, a mail call came through and brought him a letter. It was a letter from Ida, who had written him as requested. The letter is reproduced in the Watchtower article, as well as in Marley Cole's book. In the letter, Ida writes that, as a rule, she does not respond to people trying to contact her. Quote, Generally, I have refused such requests because of my desire to avoid all publicity. However, because you are a person of goodwill towards Jehovah God and his glorious theocracy, I am very happy to write you. Unquote. She then goes on to discuss her sons, describing them as good men, even though none of them embraced their mother's religion. Quote, I have been blessed with seven sons, of which five are living, all being very good to their mother, and I am constrained to believe are very fine in the eyes of those who have learned to know them. It was always my desire and my effort to raise my boys in the knowledge of and to reverence their creator. My prayer is that they all may anchor their hope in the new world, the central feature of which is the kingdom for which all good people have been praying the past 2,000 years. I feel that Dwight, my third son, will always strive to do his duty with integrity as he sees such duty. I mention him in particular because of your expressed interest in him. She goes on to write that she has been one of Jehovah's Witnesses for 49 years, and finishes by discussing the Watchtower Society theology of the time, mentioning that prophecies and revelations surely indicate that Armageddon is just around the corner. She finishes, Respectfully yours, in hope of and as a fighter for the new world, Ida E. Eisenhower. Ida was 82 years old when she wrote to Bokel, who, as he goes on to relate, was very relieved to have gotten the letter. Right after reading it, he was called into the headquarters tent. He did not salute his superior officers who noted this lack of protocol. Bokel explained the neutral stance of Jehovah's Witnesses, but the officer replied, General Eisenhower ought to line you Jehovah's Witnesses up and shoot you all. 
Do you think he would shoot his own mother, sir? Bokel asked. What do you mean by that? The officer replied. He told him he had just received a letter from the general's mother and gave the officer the letter from Ida. The officer read it along with the other headquarters staff. Bokel writes that the officer handed it back and said, Get back to ranks. I don't want to get mixed up with a general's mother. Boko was deployed to France the next month, but was ultimately able to stick to his non-combatant stance while not getting in too much trouble, and was honorably discharged in 1945. He writes that a high point was his last three days in the army when he was able to sell 203 Watchtower subscriptions to fellow soldiers. He would go on to be a congregation official and full-time volunteer preacher, known as an elder and regular pioneer, respectively. The months after D-Day were extremely busy for Ike. When the Nazi concentration camps and death camps were discovered, Eisenhower directed that extensive still and movie photographic evidence be compiled for fear that future attempts would be made to deny the Holocaust had occurred or to recharacterize it as Allied propaganda. It was several months before Ike was able to write back to Francis Curry, but in October he finally had time to respond. He wrote that he had been hearing from Abilene correspondents that reporters were hounding his mother and that Naomi Engel seemed to be encouraging such activity. Irish writes that in his letter, Ike, quote, suspected that Engel was simply too unsophisticated to deal with these people, and he hoped that his brother Milton might be able to provide his mother some peace. Ike then asked Curry to write again because his mother could no longer write easily and because... Quote, Naomi does send me a note every month or so, but she does not give me as vivid a picture of my mother's health and condition as you do. I always feel grateful to you. Unquote. In August, Ike had written to another Abilenite he frequently corresponded with during the war, a friend named Charlie Case. At the end of the letter, he asked Charlie to give his mother a ring for him. Charlie did one better and went to visit Ida when Ike's son John was also up visiting his grandmother. John had graduated from West Point that summer, on D-Day as it happened. The Army had great concern about John's safety if the enemy knew that General Eisenhower's son was in combat, and thus John was assigned stateside to intelligence and administrative duties during World War II. While not very conducive to his military career, it did allow him to see his family during the war, including his grandma in Abilene. Charlie Case wrote to Ike that both Ida and John were well, and that he was impressed how much John resembled his father. As related in Bella Kornitzer's book, The Great American Heritage, The Story of the Five Eisenhower Brothers, the boys had mounting concerns about Naomi Engel's conduct, which, in their view, seemed to skew more toward the interests of the Watchtower Society and less toward caring for Ida's well-being and privacy. In 1944, Edgar wrote to Naomi, He explained that he felt his mother was, quote, was being taken out of the home and used solely for the purpose of distributing religious literature, unquote. He defended her right to continue to believe as she saw fit, but that being said, quote, she could be easily and mistakenly influenced in performing any service which would be represented to her as helpful to the advancement of the Watchtower's religious beliefs, unquote. His concern was that she should no longer, quote, be taken from place to place and exhibited as the mother of General Eisenhower, solely for the purpose of attempting to influence anyone in his religious thinking. I want mother shielded and protected and not exposed or exhibited. I think mother's home should be maintained solely for her intimate friends and relatives, and that no stranger should be permitted to live in the house regardless of who he may be, unquote. Although Naomi may have been a good choice in terms of sharing Ida's religious beliefs, Carrie Irish writes that, quote, Engel was not as conscientious as the brothers would have liked, and she was dismissed and another caregiver hired, unquote. As the European war continued to slowly grind toward an, toward an Allied victory in 1945, Charlie wrote Ike in March. He said that he had called to check on Ida. She had fallen recently, but Overall, was doing okay. On May 7th, Germany surrendered. The war in Europe was over. Ike returned stateside in June and soon made his way back to his hometown of Abilene and his beloved mother. 
Although it was a town of 5,000, there were 20,000 people cheering and greeting him in Kansas when he arrived on June 21st. A speech I gave praised his parents and Abilene. He said, quote, Here are people that are lifelong friends of my mother and my late father, the really two great individuals of the Eisenhower family. They raised six boys, and they made sure that each had an upbringing at home and an education that equipped him to gain a respectable place in his own profession, and I think it's fair to say they all have. They and their families are the products of the loving care, labor, and work of my father and mother, just another average Abilene family, unquote. Ike and his brothers weren't the only people who thought highly of their mother, and that same year, Ida was awarded the Kansas Mother of the Year Award. Interestingly, in 1931, Jehovah's Witnesses had condemned Mother's Day as a satanic holiday, and ever since, they have not celebrated it. After his quick visit to Abilene, Ike returned to Europe, and then in November 1945, he succeeded General Marshall as Army Chief of Staff in Washington, D.C. under President Truman. Ike would hold that position until 1948 when he accepted a position as president of Columbia University. At the beginning of 1946, Fred Southworth wrote to Ike. Southworth had been in the Abilene congregation with Ida for many years and had helped do David Eisenhower's funeral. He wrote the general to let him know how Ida was doing, and Ike sent a short letter back in February thanking him for his note. The letter can be seen in Marley Cole's book. On September 11, 1946, Ida Eisenhower died of an apparent heart attack at the age of 84. She was survived by five of her sons. Once Ike, Mamie, and other family had arrived in Abilene, her funeral was held. If the Watchtower Society had hoped to share their doctrine via a funeral conducted by Jehovah's Witnesses, they would have found themselves disappointed. Private services were conducted at the Eisenhower home, followed by a public service at the graveside in the Abilene Cemetery, and both services were conducted by an army chaplain from nearby Fort Riley, Kansas. It's an interesting twist that David Eisenhower received a Jehovah's Witness funeral while no longer believing, and Ida received a non-witness funeral while still practicing as a witness. The October 22, 1946 Awake magazine, published by Jehovah's Witnesses, ran an article almost apoplectic with rage, condemning what it viewed as this outrageous desecration of Ida's memory. Under the title, Religion Devoid of Principle, and the subtitle, Disrespect, the article comes out swinging. It says, quote, Both services were handled by an army chaplain from Fort Riley. Was that in respect for Mrs. Eisenhower? Pallbearers were three American legionnaires and three veterans of foreign wars. Was that appropriate? Though Time Magazine claimed Ida Stover Eisenhower was a member of the River Brethren, a Mennonite sect, Time was merely continuing its consistent policy of slander in all that pertains to Jehovah's Witnesses. She was never a River Brethren. She was one of Jehovah's Witnesses, unquote. Well, as we've seen, there is plenty of evidence to suggest that Ida was indeed a member of the Brethren in Christ earlier in life, to the point of attending a Brethren college. The article also states that her husband, David, was one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Again, the article probably oversteps the bounds of truth. It's doubtful he was even a Bible student for the entire period that name was used, and there's even less evidence that he was ever one of Jehovah's Witnesses. The article goes on, quote, Mrs. I.S. Eisenhower, like all Jehovah's Witnesses, believed religion a racket, and the clergy in general, including army chaplains, to be hypocrites. She harbored no special pride for General Ike. She was opposed to his West Point appointment. It was gross disrespect to the deceased for an army chaplain to officiate at the funeral, unquote. When Ida was asked one time by reporters what she thought of her famous son, she replied feistily, which son do you mean? To her, all her sons held an equal place in her heart. And so when the Watchtower Society tries to imply she was not proud of Ike, they mischaracterize a contented mother. She harbored no special pride for Ike because she was equally proud of him as she was each of her other boys, all of whom had chosen different paths in life. The article winds up, quote, 
Only death could keep the body of Mrs. Eisenhower from walking away from a funeral so disrespectful of all that she stood for, unquote. Now, the society does not seem to have checked in with any of Ida's sons to see if they were actually satisfied with how the funeral went, and the numerous Eisenhower biographies seem to make no mention of her actual family members being upset in any way with the proceedings, despite all the fuming going on in the Awake article. In 1950, Ike accepted a position as Supreme Commander of NATO, which had just been created. In 1952, he ran for president with the Republican Party and won in a landslide against Adlai Stevenson. Ike was 62, the oldest president-elect in 100 years. It was only when he ran for president that he seriously considered joining a church for the first time in his life. Initially, he resisted the idea. He complained that no one ever asked him about God. Instead, they always asked, what is your church? But he began to rethink his position when talking to Claire Luce, the wife of Henry Luce, the publisher of Time and Life magazines. The Luces were early supporters of his presidential run. Claire pointed out that a president is a role model for the nation's youth. If Ike did not attend church, children could tell their parents, why do I have to go to church? The President of the United States has never gone to church and refuses to go to church. David Holm writes that Ike replied, Oh boy, I never thought of that. He and Mamie began attending the Presbyterian Church, the uh, religion Mamie had known as a girl, and Ike got baptized Presbyterian 10 days after his inauguration. Now, while some criticize this change as a shallow, calculated political ploy, The references make it evident that the quiet faiths of his mother and father had influenced Ike profoundly throughout his life, and they had left him a spiritual person, though not one who felt organized religion was necessarily essential. In the book Presidential Profiles, Religion in the Life of American Presidents, John Sutherland Bunnell wrote that, quote, To the very close of his life, Dwight Eisenhower carried in his mind and heart the indelible imprint of his parents' religion, unquote. Edgar Eisenhower also addressed this accusation, saying, quote, We boys are all religious, but we don't go around saying, I am a religious man, any more than we would say, I am an honest man, or I am a clean man, or I pay my bills, unquote. In 1969, Ike would say that, quote, Although I have seldom displayed or discussed my religious philosophy with anyone, a deep Bible-centered faith has colored my life since childhood. Devout parents who loved the Bible as deeply as life itself made sure of that. Indeed, before I was 18, I had read through the entire Bible and discussed it chapter by chapter with my mother." Once Ike decided to set a good example for the nation's youth and display his religious faith more publicly, he jumped in with both feet. One of the floats in the January 20th, 1953 inaugural parade was titled, God's Float. After being given the oath of office, he said, quote, My friends, before I begin the expression of those thoughts that I deem appropriate to this moment, would you permit me the privilege of uttering a little private prayer of my own? And I ask that you bow your heads, unquote. He then gave a short prayer out loud, asking God to help him and his fellow workers to carry out their offices to the best of their ability and to care for the interests of all, regardless of race or calling. Holmes writes that letters soon began pouring into the White House asking for a copy of the text of the prayer. By 1957, the prayer had been set to music and even performed in Washington by the Howard University Choir, accompanied by the National Symphony Orchestra. Ike directed that his cabinet sessions always begin in prayer. He began the now customary prayer breakfasts on Capitol Hill. He proclaimed days of prayer for the nation. The words, pray for peace, appeared on canceled mail. In 1954, Congress added the words, under God, to the Pledge of Allegiance. In 1956, Ike approved the addition of, in God we trust, to U.S. paper currency. A young 34-year-old evangelist preacher named Billy Graham began visiting the Eisenhower White House, becoming a spiritual advisor to the 62-year-old Ike, the first of many presidents to have such a relationship with Graham. In 1947, Billy Graham had become known for holding large services or revivals he called crusades. Up to a million people attended these annual events. 
In 1948, Ike had published a best-selling memoir of his war experiences, perhaps coincidentally called Crusade in Europe. In 1955, a book was published called The Great American Heritage, The Story of the Five Eisenhower Brothers. It was written by Bella Kornitzer, who had been a well-known reporter in Hungary. Kornitzer immigrated to the U.S. in 1947, learned English from watching movies, and then promptly resumed his journalism career, interviewing such notable subjects as Albert Einstein and Harry Truman. His book on the Eisenhowers became a national bestseller. Although discussing the religious values of the Eisenhowers at length, there was no mention of Jehovah's Witnesses in the book. It discussed the River Brethren, mentioned that David and Ida had, quote, fundamentalist religious beliefs, unquote, and said that they were Bible students who followed the writings of a Pastor Russell, but that was as close as it came to referencing the Watchtower Society or the Witnesses. In 1956, Jack Anderson, a journalist who, together with Drew Pearson, wrote a popular syndicated Washington gossip column that was called The Washington Merry-Go-Round, explained why Witnesses were missing from the book. Quote, both Dwight and his brother Milton checked the manuscript of Bella Kornitzer's book, Story of the Five Eisenhower Brothers. Afterward, Milton privately asked Kornitzer to delete a reference to their parents' membership in the Witnesses sect. Unquote. The Chicago Daily News also either noticed this omission or was notified of it, and in an article dated June 23, 1955, said that, quote, the author of a forthcoming book about President Eisenhower and his four brothers says their mother's religious affiliation with the Jehovah's Witnesses sect was omitted at the request of Milton Eisenhower. Kornitzer said that the Witnesses' affiliation is, quote, a very ticklish and irritating subject, unquote, with the Eisenhower brothers. He said he discussed it at length with them in preparing his book. He said his book was, quote, edited by Milton and the President. It's their record. If I were writing an interpretive biography, perhaps it would be different. But the entire book is theirs, edited by them. Unquote. The newspaper article also contained quotes from Hayden Covington, the Watchtower Society's lead counsel, as well as Milton Henschel, a society director who would later become president of the society. Henschel told the Daily News, It's, quote, not a big issue with us, and we're not trying to ride on Mrs. Eisenhower's coattails. We know what the truth is, however. Ida Eisenhower was one of the most energetic preachers in Abilene, Kansas. At our national headquarters in Brooklyn, we have pictures of her preaching. Unquote. In the September 22, 1955 issue of Awake, right above an article criticizing Billy Graham, the Society's lead article was about Jehovah's Witnesses not being mentioned in Kornitzer's book, with the headline, Eisenhower Book Stirs a Controversy. The article, well, a bit less apoplectic than the article about Ida's funeral, nonetheless has a rather grumpy tone. It says, quote, Especially will people who read the facts in Jehovah's Witnesses, the New World Society, that was published at almost the same time, Wonder why the Great American Heritage mentions only the writings of Pastor Russell and the meetings of the Bible students, but does not say that this was merely the pre-1931 name for Jehovah's Witnesses, that for 50 years the mother of the five Eisenhower brothers had been one of Jehovah's Witnesses, that for 20 years beginning in 1896 the group now known as Jehovah's Witnesses met in the Eisenhower home, and during that most and that during most of that time their father David Eisenhower conducted the Bible study. Unquote. As the Awake article says, Marley Cole published his book, Jehovah's Witnesses, The New World Society, the same year that Bella Kornitzer's book came out. Cole made sure to set the record straight in a section titled, What Did the pa President's Parents Believe? As an active witness himself, Cole was granted access to a number of Watchtower sources and, as we have seen, was able to include images of a number of letters from Ida demonstrating she was indeed a Jehovah's Witness. Another image reproduced in the book is from the business manager of the local newspaper, the Abilene Daily Reflector Chronicle. Cole writes that, in the spring of 1955, witnesses Lotta Thayer and Naomi Engel 
went to the newspaper offices to get to the bottom of why the newspaper was covering up the fact that Ida had been one of Jehovah's Witnesses, or at most was stating she had joined the religion late in life. They met with Charlie Harger, the newspaper editor who had helped put the Eisenhower boys through college and had escorted Ida to Abilene's Ike Day in 1942. They also met with Henry Jameson, the newspaper's business manager. Harger died shortly after the meeting, but Jameson wrote a letter to Lada apologizing for the error. He explained that there was no grand cover-up being carried out. Rather, few people had realized that the Bible students and Jehovah's Witnesses were actually the same organization, and so they had thought that Ida had changed religions late in her life. Cole's book was published by Vantage Press, not the Watchtower Society. However, it was advertised in the Watchtower magazine as seen in this blurb in the August 15, 1955 issue, and the Society kept the book in its inventory of literature for sale to subscribers. In 1956, Ike won a second term as president, again in a landslide against Adelaide Stevenson. For his second inauguration, held January 20, 1957, Ike used the Bible his mother had given him when he graduated from West Point in 1915, uh, he used this for the swearing-in ceremony. He had it open to Psalm thirty-three, twelve, which, in the American Standard Version he was holding, reads, Blessed is the nation whose God is Jehovah, the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. However, the media coverage of the inauguration quoted the verse as it is found in the King James Version, which reads, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. After Ida's non-Jehovah's Witness funeral, and then Jehovah's Witnesses being edited out of Bella Kornitzer's book, the press not using the verse that had the word Jehovah was just about the last straw for the Watchtower Society. They sensed that these were not simply unrelated coincidences, and in the June 1, 1957 issue of the Watchtower, they began to throw around the C word. It says, Why the substitution of Lord for Jehovah? And by whom was it made? Is there a conspiracy against the name of Jehovah on the part of the American press, similar to that practiced by the translators of the Revised Standard Version, whose about face made fools of their learned predecessors who produced the American Standard Version? That conspiracy might be involved is apparent from what Jack Anderson, junior partner of Drew Pearson, wrote in Pearson's Washington Merry-Go-Round, as quoted in the Detroit Free Press, December 19, 1956. President Eisenhower, whose mother once sold Bible tracts for the Jehovah's Witnesses, is looking for a delicate way to clear the family name of this affiliation. He is sensitive about the fact that Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in saluting the flag or serving under arms. Inside story is that the president's mother was influenced in her old age by a nurse who belonged to the sect. Being Bible-minded, Mrs. Eisenhower cheerfully agreed to help the Jehovah's Witnesses peddle Bible tracts. Now the Eisenhower brothers would like to find a graceful way to announce that their mother was not at heart a Jehovah's Witness. Unquote. Now, the Washington merry-go-round column was known for playing fast and loose with the facts, and there is zero evidence that the Eisenhower brothers were trying to rewrite history and say that their mother was not a Jehovah's Witness. But the conspiracy theory posed in the Watchtower magazine of the media trying to suppress Jehovah's Witnesses is not a one-off theory just in this article. It is instead a core part of Watchtower theology. As illustrated on the cover of the Witness tract, Who Really Rules the World?, Witnesses have long held that Satan the devil is controlling human society using his three main tools of religion, the commercial or business sphere, and politics, often augmenting these three with the media. The following quotes from Watchtower literature over the years are a representative sampling of this teaching. Then you may succeed in escaping all these troubles and distresses that will come upon the devil's system of things at one time, completely wiping it out, the political system, the religious system, the commercial system, and abyssing the demons who control this world, and even the devil himself. Watchtower, January 1, 1959, page 11. The devil's earthly empire, 
commercial, political, and religious, is doomed and already exposed as being incurably corrupt, diseased, and filthy. Watchtower, August 1st, 1970, page 463. Indeed, consider what the situation will be the day after God brings his system of things to its end. Satan, his demons, and his political, commercial, and religious systems will be gone. Every one of them. Satan's entire propaganda apparatus will be gone, too. Watchtower, April 1st, 1993, page 17. Satan would like to stop our witnessing work, and by means of his agents on earth, whether religious, commercial, or political, he tries to intimidate us. Watchtower, February 1st, 2004, page 16. What a mighty witness about God's kingdom is being given in all nations before the system end comes. That is despite the fact that Satan is the god of this system of things. All political, religious, and commercial elements of this world, as well as its propaganda channels, are being influenced by him. Watchtower, March 15, 2009, page 17. And finally, Satan has always controlled the commercial, political, and religious systems of this world. Watchtower, January 2020, page 14. So with this worldview, it's not much of a stretch for the Watchtower Society members to connect the threads and see a vast conspiracy going on behind the scenes of the interactions between the Eisenhower family and the Jehovah's Witness religion. But while these issues were foremost on the minds of witnesses, the rest of the world had larger concerns, and many key events transpired during the years of the Eisenhower presidency, including the end of the Korean War, the start of the Vietnam War, the creation of NASA, McCarthyism, a U-2 spy plane being shot down over Russia, integrating schools in Little Rock, Arkansas, and creating a national interstate highway system. Ike appointed five Supreme Court justices, and two states were admitted to the Union, Alaska and Hawaii. After serving two terms, Ike and Mamie moved to the place that they had spent much of their post-war time, a working farm near Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. He remained somewhat active in politics, campaigning for various candidates. Ike's health was not the best, and he suffered seven heart attacks between 1955 and 1969. His autopsy found an adrenal pheochromocytoma, a benign adrenaline-secreting tumor which may have made him more susceptible to heart disease, but Ike was also a smoker and drank alcohol frequently. On March 28, 1969, Ike died of congestive heart failure at Walter Reed Medical Center in Washington, D.C. He was 78. After the funeral services in Washington, his body was placed on a special funeral train for his trip to his final resting place in Abilene. He was buried in the chapel on the grounds of the Eisenhower Presidential Center alongside his son Dowd, who had died at three years old in 1921. Mamie would also be buried there after her death in 1979. After Ida died in 1946, the boys donated her home to a historical foundation, and it was opened to the public as a historical site the following year. In 1954, a nearby Eisenhower Museum was completed, and in 1959, a presidential library joined the existing buildings. The chapel and a visitor center completed the presidential center complex that now exists in Abilene. Eisenhower Center records show that the Watchtower Society is one of many organizations which have contributed to improving the center. For example, in 2002, copies of hundreds of records were donated by Jehovah's Witnesses to the presidential library. The records, which covered a time span from 1912 to 1943, consisted of all the congregation paperwork from the Abilene and Manhattan congregations that mentioned Ida or David Eisenhower. The donation project was overseen by Richard McIntyre, who in 2002 was the area circuit overseer, a regional representative of the Watchtower Society. As part of her thesis research, Gladys Dodd attempted to locate the large pyramid chart which had so famously hung in the Eisenhower home for decades. She found that it had still been in the home as late as 1944, but in 1957 she could no longer locate it either in the family home or in the Eisenhower Museum nearby. 
She learned that the chart and other Watchtower items evidently had been discarded by the Eisenhower sons, and her conclusion was that they were probably destroyed by the family to reduce their embarrassment over their parents' involvement in Jehovah's Witnesses. In his book, Ike the Soldier, Merle Miller writes that, quote, At the time of Ida's death, there was a 50-year collection of Watchtower magazines in the house on Southeast 4th Street. The publication had arrived by mail from 1896 to 1946. It was Milton who bundled up the 50-year collection of the presumably embarrassing magazines and got them out of the, uh, the Eisenhower house and away from the eyes of reporters. He gave them to a neighbor and witness. Marley Cole writes that the neighbor and witness was Lotta Thayer, who was married to fellow witness Dr. James Thayer. While Miller describes Milton's giving the magazine collection to Lotta as an effort to hide the embarrassing magazines from reporters, Cole, on the other hand, characterizes the donation as a, quote, grief-burdened but generous gesture, unquote. It is true that the boys were reticent to discuss their own religious beliefs, and even more so that of their parents, to the point that biographers were often left rather confused as to which groups David and Ida had actually belonged to. But there's no reason to think that Ike was ashamed of his mother's beliefs. In his 1967 memoir, At Ease, Stories I Tell to Friends, Ike freely writes about his mother's belonging to Jehovah's Witnesses. He wrote that, quote, She had gravitated to a local group known as the Bible Class. In this group, which had no church or minister, she was happy. Sunday meetings were always held in the homes of members, including ours. The unusual program of worship included hymns, for which mother played the piano, and prayers, with the rest of the time devoted to group discussions of a selected chapter of the Bible. There was eventually a kind of loose association with similar groups throughout the country, chiefly through a subscription to a religious periodical, The Watchtower. After I left home for the army, these groups were drawn closer together and finally adopted the name of Jehovah's Witnesses. They were true conscientious objectors to war. Though none of her sons could accept her convictions in this matter, she refused to try to push her beliefs on us, just as she refused to modify her own. Unquote. In a Christian religion such as Jehovah's Witnesses, which takes such a fundamentalist view of the Bible, a patriarchal, male-dominated structure is the norm. If one were to try and make a list of the top five most notable female Jehovah's Witnesses, it is surprisingly difficult to even think of a single name to put on the list. Women among Jehovah's Witnesses, which, while, while handling a major part of the door-to-door -door evangelizing work, are required to do their work in humble submission to men. They are barred from holding any positions of responsibility in the organization. With the bar thus set so low, it is safe to say that Ida Eisenhower is the most famous female witness in history. There's no other woman that the Watchtower Society has written about in multiple articles who has her picture hanging inside the world headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses, as Milton Henschel told a reporter. And while he would say that the Watchtower Society was not trying to ride the coattails of Mrs. Eisenhower, it's not hard to think that their interest in her was primarily due to her prominence as the mother of General and later President Eisenhower. It's intriguing to imagine a witness mother in a congregation today who has six children, each of whom left the Jehovah's Witnesses, all of whom went off to college and then immersed themselves in business, politics, and the military. Would such a witness woman be held up as an exemplary example for others in the congregation to imitate? Would she have multiple Watchtower articles written about her? The answer is no. Such a woman would be a failure in the eyes of the Jehovah's Witness religion. Yet, if her son was the President of the United States of America, the Watchtower Society would probably have a much different perspective based on how Ida was treated. What's most evident is that while someone like Ida Eisenhower may have been viewed as a failure by the Watchtower Society, only good in terms of the publicity she could bring to the religion, to her husband and sons, and indeed the friends that knew her well in Abilene, Ida was anything but a failure. 
She was a most excellent person, hailed by Kansans as Mother of the Year, and certainly viewed that way by her boys. From one perspective, she really didn't accomplish very much, living a quiet life in the middle of a small town in Kansas. And yet, isn't that the goal of each worshiper of God? The Apostle Paul put it this way at 1 Timothy 2, 2 and 3. In the Bible, Jehovah's Witnesses currently use the New World Translation, quote, in order that we may go on leading a calm and quiet life with full godly devotion and seriousness. This is fine and acceptable in the sight of our Savior, God, unquote. The lives of Ida and David were in complete accord with that sentiment, and they raised sons who inherited those same values, men their parents could be very proud of indeed. And so there you have it, a look at the Eisenhowers and Jehovah's Witnesses. Thanks for watching. Check out the references in the description box, and we'll catch you on the next one. Take care.